I have a series of quick announcements. Then I'm going to show you, as usual, the plans for the week and what was posted under the new week four page. Then we will spend most of our time today discussing the themes and ideas found in Jules Verne's <coughs> literature, Jules Verne being the author of two series of excerpts that were uh, listed as required readings. First announcement is just a reminder that when you go to the calendar page, you can not only see my availability in person and on Zoom, but you can also click on the Calendly app. You don't need to have the app. Once you click in there, then you'll be offered a series of options. You can click on a date, see what times are available. Let me show you. So I go here and then I can see, for example, what times an appointment is still possible at this point for Friday and always looking ahead by three weeks. This Wednesday, I'm not offering any Zoom office hours. I have a doctor's appointment and then I'm seeing a graduate student that is doing a dissertation under my supervision. As promised, I process quickly some of the pictures I took when I went to the historic festival, vintage car races at Lime Rock Park in Connecticut. So you find in here a short video. This is the area where cars in the alleged pre-war category, because you see that in reality these categories are interpreted pretty loosely. Only one of the cars on the other side is really pre-war, and pre-war in this context means before World War II, and, and this is the area where they gather before they enter the racetrack over there for a formation lap, and they have a rolling start behind the pace car. If you click on this link, you can see a few of the pictures that I took and that I thought might be significant examples of older cars, of course, you, you never find the really oldest kind of cars at this kind of event. If you go to California, if you go to Pebble Beach, you can find pre-1910 car, sometimes pre-1900 cars. In here, usually it's after 1910 with only a few exemplars representing that decade and more often after 1920, 1930. I added a few captions, uh, often just to identify the car, sometimes to add something significant. For example, this car, which was brought to Lime Rock by an institute, a research institute in Florida, uh, that is specializing on the study of automotive technology. They have a wonderful archive, including some very old uh, documents on the car. They're called REVs and they're in Naples or Tampa, um, and they brought this Fiat 600 Multipla from circa 1957, and uh, I added a link and a brief explanation because uh, you might not imagine that when Apple decided that they were going to build their own electric vehicle, stealing engineers from Tesla and other companies, they purchased a vintage example of this very model because this was their idea for a futuristic electric vehicle. That is to say something that would be small but with an efficient usage of the space uh, inside. And, and this uh, is what was inspiring to their group. Then Apple decided not to make a 
real electric vehicle to uh, focus on the hardware side of the business, they announced they were going to develop software for self-driving cars and lately I, I, I haven't heard anything from, from that section of their company. Uh, it, it, it might be that they've renounced on any plan of engagement in this field. I have corrected, reviewed, and graded all of the assignments uh, uh, that were, were uh, submitted by the students. I've added a few suggestions that I invite you to review, best practices to do well in those assignments. Number one, most important thing, always make specific examples the strongest part of your assignments. And of course, the examples by themselves are not sufficient. You need to describe the example, but then you need to support it with relevant analytical comments. It's a short assignment, right? Bet usually between 300 and 600 words. So if you don't have a brilliant idea for an introduction or a conclusion, just don't, okay? Don't feel the need to add a paragraph just to have an introduction if all you're going to say is, some people think that cars still retain their magic. Others contend that cars have lost their magic. I agree with the first group in some regards and with the second in other regards. It's all very predictable, right? So again, you might want to just go to the first interesting remark or interesting example. Your short assignment doesn't need to be a, sh a miniature paper, okay? Don't use emphatic style. If you're trying to make a point, it should be made with concepts. Don't use huge uh, and, and such and similar adjectives. And of course, spend five minutes reviewing your, maybe 10 even, reviewing your assignment when you're done. Get rid of typos. I'm surprised by the number of typos because the browser should tell you, if enabled, not only which typos to avoid, but also major syntactical issues with the sentences, and you just have to confirm simple changes. Chrome will tell you the verb is missing here. You should have cars instead of car. Is should be added there. Whatever, however you want to proceed, check for typos. Make sure capitalization is, is taken care of, right? you might believe that it is a kind of academic fixation. And indeed, I'll admit that for academics, small things such as capitalization are a matter of life and death. I don't know if you have ever seen this video by College Humor called Grammar Nazis, which is based on, it's a spoof off of Inglorious Bastards by Tarantino, only the Nazi officer is fixating on grammar. And yes, a lot of faculty can be classified as grammar Nazis that way. However, even when you go and work on an, in an office, your sloppy language, including lack of proper capitalization, might irk a customer, right? You want to represent your company at its best. And even the language that you send out, even in a simple email, is a representation of your company. So keep that in mind, it's not, it's good discipline, however you look at it. It's not just for professors, okay? And of course, I should have added, but I didn't. I'll tell you now, when you're writing, write for some kind of average reader in mind. Don't write for me, okay? So in the assignment on the video, you don't say, I'm commenting the third video, right? Think of someone reading the assignment in isolation from the context of the class. So use the title, right? 
I watched the video entitled so and so, and, and these are my comments. And don't write for me also means don't try to please me, right? You don't have to agree with me, you can disagree. The point is, can you argue uh, well in a logical, reasoned way using an argument that is supported by good examples, etc. I don't need to be candid too, okay? And I added a few things about formatting in the Google Docs file. Good practice in, the, in, in regard to that would be to place your newest assignment on top, so both you and I open the file and go straight to it without having to scroll down through stuff that is old. Uh, and don't delete the old assignments. You can resolve any of the comments, right? Unless you want to keep them for future reference. And even the grade and the comments accompanying the grade, I have a copy of them in my Excel file. So it's up to you whether you want to keep them or not. Keep in mind these Google Docs files are only accessible to each of you individually and me, no one else. Uh, can see them. When it comes to formatting, good practice would be to format the title as heading one because this way we would have a nice outline to jump to any of the assignments and format the body of the assignment as normal. Of course you may use another word processor and then paste the assignment in it but spend a few seconds to uh, format it as normal and the normal style in each file has been already made standard and it has a, a, a kind of large font. This is not because I wear glasses and I'm an old man. Yes, I am and, and I do. It's simply because in some instances I may leave several comments and if you have a text formatted small that occupies this much, then the comments become much longer and it's more difficult for any, both you and me, to understand what the comments is about, okay? With a larger character and a narrow text, then the alignment is not problematic. And just for the last time, in this class, for this kind of assignment, it's not a big issue if you need a few more days, if you need a brief extension, just be professional. Just put a comment inside. You place the title inside the, of the assignment inside the file, and then you add a comment where you say, please, can I have an extension up to Friday, up to Monday, uh, etc., and I'll receive a notification. That was it for the announcements. I just received from Johnny uh, a flyer uh, and I'll, I'll make it into an announcement, but if you want to see it at the end of the class, it's about a concours, uh, a gathering of exotic cars in West Hampton Beach uh, this Sunday, uh, yes. And uh, they're looking for volunteers and it, it's a benefit, so the, they have cars, people will pay a ticket. It might be a good way to get free entrance, free admission into the event because as I was telling Joni a couple of weeks ago, there was a similar charity event with cars in Southampton and they wanted at least a hundred dollars to uh, enter. Um, week four, this is what you find in the page for week four, you find a presentation with notes that I'll be using today and Thursday, and a, one of the readings that I'll be commenting, commenting about briefly today or Thursday. For the second week, we will be watching scenes from Bumblebee, and I added However, because this time I want to conduct a brief analysis of the movie, of the visual style of the movie, so I added frames, as in the case of Low Bug, from the movie. So if you want to see what the camera does with the characters when Charlie wakes up 
these are frames that are representative of pretty much every camera angle. Uh, I tend to be generous, I usually have when I do these things, more than a thousand, sometimes close to 2,000 screenshots taken from the uh, film. I, I, of course, I have a script to do that. I, I'm not frantically pressing a button, as you might imagine, although I, I'd be crazy enough to do that, for sure. Uh, the assignments review the presentation, that will be discussed today, and then you have two uh, sets of excerpts from uh, Jules Verne, and uh, there, were, uh, there was a written assignment, but I decided to move it ahead by a week, because this way, by next Tuesday, you will not only have heard about Verne and his narratives about technology, but also you will have heard uh, my analysis of select passages, okay? So that's why I moved the assignment. Okay, this is it. Uh, this is from the poster of a 1960s film on the first novel, because the novel we're reading from The Master of the World is part of a series of two novels with the same evil character and slightly different technologies. Of course, those technologies were reinterpreted uh, quite freely in the film, in the original novel. It is not a dirigible that this madman inventor Robo is flying the skies on uh, its an actual ship made of metal. Okay. Some parts of this presentation I'm just going to present to you and I'm going to send you, direct you to uh, these sections for, for reading. I'm not going to be here repeating or clarifying or expanding on everything that is in here. I want to focus on just some aspects. If you want to know more about this French 19th century author's biography life, you can click on these links. Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia, but those would be optional readings, not required readings. I have myself added in this page excerpts from the Encyclopedia Britannica article with just the passages that are relevant from us, for us. We don't have to know everything about the author. If you don't know about Jules Verne, Jules Verne is practically one of the pioneers, one of the founders of science fiction, of the proper science fiction. That is to say, a kind of narrative, a kind of fiction that is heavily focused on advanced technologies. And he, he was born in 18, 1828. He uh, uh, started writing in 1863. He died in 1905 or, or 1904. Um, and, yeah, I believe it's 1905. Um, but he was a huge success on both sides of the Atlantic, both in, in North America and in, in several European countries up until the 1960s and, 60s and 70s. His books were published over, over and over again and, and read by generations of, of kids, including uh, myself, and in fact, if you look at pictures, you can see that even Walt Disney Parks based a lot of um, rides on his novels, and Walt Disney produced some of the films. Other novels were made into films by others, not just Disney. In case you don't know much about Hearn, I've added uh, a, a series of technologies that are typical of the narratives that were created, produced by this French author. For example, in the novel From the Earth to the Moon, originally published in 1865, this was one of the first bestsellers from Verne. His career had started only two years earlier with a failure, with a manuscript that was not published. It was published 
uh, 130 years later at the end of the 20th century. Uh, but in, in this novel, he imagines that a group of people uh, make this giant cannon, the barrel of which is almost entirely underground in Florida, and out of this barrel, a projectile is shot with people on board. So it's a projectile because it's expelled by a cannon, but at the same time, it becomes a space train. And it's, it's very much a train. It was typical of Jules Verne to create new technologies through a process of expanding uh, the features of technologies from the time or making hybrids between different technologies. So this is it. You can see what, what I mean. Let me make it larger. Okay, I hope you can see it. Uh, and you can see that it is a projectile similar to what would be pushed out from the barrel, the muzzle of a cannon. But at the same time, it's like a train with different sections linked together, and there are windows, and people uh, uh, spend time and live in there. And uh, because of the explosion, they're being propelled towards the moon. And of course, then you have, as an author, to figure out how they are going to survive and come back, since they don't have their own jet engines on board. Right? 1870, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was made into both a film and a famous ride by the Walt Disney Company. You find Captain Nemo on board an electric submarine. In here, you can see just the bridge of the submarine, uh, which is. Uh, immersed in the water, and this is an electrical submarine that is able to go around the globe with its electrical engine. Submarines already existed. He just made this submarine fancier. Same with this example, a novel in that is about this giant vessel that is essentially like a small town, right? housing thousands and thousands of people. You can see the size of regular boats compared to this behemoth. And the name of the novel was A Floating City, 1871. This is the first novel in which we find the madman inventor of a master of the world. So this is the first part of a narrative that we will focus on and discuss. And in Robert the Conqueror, you find this flying ship, which is essentially like a ship, right? It is exactly like a regular ship, a, a kind of modern steamship that you would have found on the Atlantic Ocean. However, it flies because it, it has giant propellers in front and in the back and it's floating on the air because it has a forest of blades like a helicopter keeping it afloat. And again, electricity is what um, is, is a form of energy that makes this go. And of course, you can see that it's not a peaceful thing. You can see the cannon on the bridge as well. So this would be an example of a hybrid technology. And finally, the sequel to The Clipper of the Clouds, but the other going title is Robert the Conqueror, is the Maître du Monde, uh, the master of the world, which we're reading from, from 1904. And in here, Verne, Verne who himself had in fact predicted the automobiles, in his first manuscript, which was rejected by his publisher in 1863, he had talked about a future city of Paris in the 1960s, he imagined that to happen, uh, where taxicabs with gas 
engines uh, were taking people around. That was never published. He came back to this idea that technology of the automobile in a master of the world, however, he made it fancier, supersized, by imagining a kind of universal transportation device uh, called the Pouvant, uh, the, the, the scaremonger, uh, which is able, in, in the translation is the terror, uh, which is able to move on a road, move inside the water, floating on the water and moving like a boat, going under the water like a submarine, and going up in the sky like a plane. And we have this beautiful French edition from 1906 to give us some illustrations of this technology. This is a 1906 edition. There it is, Master of the World. And in here you find the protagonist on the side of good versus evil, who is John Strzok, a federal agent of some kind who sent to investigate on this uh, formidable invention and technology. And you see in here, you see the four uh, uh, stages of travel, the four formats of travel for this vehicle represented in this illustration. At the top, you see it fly with wings. It's actually flapping wings. And in here, you see it moving like an automobile. And this is supposed to be dust, because of course, before asphalt road, the passage of a fast vehicle would generate a lot of dust. And so this uh, amount of dust is, is suggestive of very high speed. And in here, you see it in between being submerged and going above water, right? So one, two, three, and four would be the format. And of course, you see boats and they're still sailboats, which is very realistic, right? As we said, in the 1900s, a lot of fishing was, was done with sailboats, not boats with an engine. That was still a novelty. And this is suggestive of the idea that this vehicle is threatening because it's disrupting the commercial activity of um, fishermen at the same time is endangering people on the streets and for the flying form, form of transportation, the idea of threat is communicated by the vicinity, the proximity with uh, a, uh, an invented, a pseudo mountain in North Carolina with volcanic activities. In here, you see the car going by, but you can barely see it because of the speed, and you can see people being thrown up off the road, off of the road. In here, you see the illustration before the first chapter, that gives you simply an idea of tranquility, but this tranquility is about to be disturbed by the invention. So you see regular people with carriages and horses, a pretty natural landscape with its obligatory river, and then you see this mountain that Vern imagined. Vern himself had traveled to the United States, and he imagined this mountain to exist as a Dormian volcano in North Carolina. And this is the place inside the crater where Robo, the inventor, puts together and tests his invention. And the flames that you saw in the illustration before were not real volcanic activity. They were just the lights of the shop fabricating this invention. And the thunder of the volcano was just the sound of the engine of this vehicle. In another illustration, you see the public trying to see, <coughs> to read about this event, right? They think something is going on. It might be a volcanic eruption. It might be some kind of evil appearance. The devil 
himself and everyone is reading, notice also the way they're dressed, because in this kind of novel, what's important is how the middle class is being influenced in relationship to the acceptance of anything, including in new technology, okay? So these are the people who weigh on social and political decisions and can be influenced with newspapers or other media. This is the vehicle itself at rest. So these are the wings tagged near the body. You can see that there are small wheels uh, with rubber uh, tires in front and big wheels possibly made of wood or metal in the back. There is a hatch that is very reminiscent of a submarine. There is a cupola in here for the driver but from the relationship between the scale of this figure here and the vehicle itself, you can see that this is not exactly the kind of individual technology that the automobile was supposed to be. This is still more similar to a train or a ship. It requires a crew to be operated. So from this point of view, Verne, was not really aligned, again, it was the end of his life, this was his last major novel, although his son continued to publish for another 20 years, saying, oh, I found this manuscript and I finished it, but we know now that his son was really adding a lot, that what he found was at best just an idea that he developed into a novel. So at the end of his life, of a long life, uh, his thinking was not really aligned with the reality of the technology. And I must say, though, that in other novels from the period with automobiles, the scenes where you have an automobile chasing another, for example, in the black car, automobiles are still treated like trains or ships, uh, where the operation of these vehicles involves a kind of thinking that would be the same kind of thinking of someone steering a ship into a port or maneuvering a train on the railroad. This is a repeat of the same scene with the disruption of the fishing by this technology, so society is being threatened, right? The core activities of society, the economy is being threatened and in here, this illustration accompanies the revelation that the commander and the inventor of the terror of this thing that goes on the road, on the sea, under the sea, in the sky, is the same madman inventor who created the flying ship and is come back after many years with this new invention threatening the peace of the world, okay? And that was it. There are people, believe it or not, who make a living realizing models for museums, models that require hundreds or a few thousands of hours, and I have included a link and images of such a model because someone um, realized, based on the description in a very uh, careful, thorough uh, way uh, realized a model of the terror that was then also included in a book. So from the website of the creator of this model, it looks like an illustration, but it's actually a 3D model. In here you have, I'm sorry, not the terror, you have the flying ship of the first novel with Robert where you can appreciate how this is, in fact, a traditional ship with a bridge, with cabins, uh, with uh, round windows on the side, and the two propellers, one in front, one in the back, a rudder, and the many tall blades that keep it flo afloat. Allegedly, oh, forgot to mention, the legs that allow it to uh, uh, come and rest on the ground. Right? Otherwise, as a ship with, with the round pole, it would capsize. This is seen from above, 
and the ship is called the Albatross. And you have in here different views. As I said before, from the article of the Encyclopedia Britannica, I've excerpted in here just the relevant passages, so this is part of your readings, and if you want, you can click on the links if you're curious. It talks about two phases in the literature by Verne. One is a more optimistic phase with more confidence and trust and hope associated with the technologies, and then a pessimist uh, period, uh, which is the one uh, for master of the world that you find mentioned here at the very end. Verne wrote a lot of books. Not all of them are about technology. Some of them are just about exotic voyages and the exploration of parts of the world uh, that had not been fully explored or Otherwise, Verne is conjuring places that uh, still need to be revealed. The most relevant novels for us is the novels that we can classify as technological fiction because the technology is not just there in the background. It is really the central focus of the narrative, right? As in to make a comparison, if you think about the first trilogy of Star Wars, yes, you find technology there. But the technology is not really central. It's not really primary, right? It's just part of the heroic life of the protagonists. But essentially, the first trilogy is like a medieval fairy tale where the knights are have uh, uh, laser swords and travel on starships. The technological fiction often turns into dark science because the inventor is often a kind of madman who's threatening the balance of the world, the balance of society. Of course it is commercial literature and therefore you find an element of serialization. You have someone who's trying to turn out as many novels as possible to make as much money as possible. Therefore, a lot of his novels are based on simple templates. For example, this is what happens with his novels. It still happens with a lot of movies. Too many movies have a very nice, intricate opening, but the conclusion is very simplistic, right? Because it's easier to set up a very complicated premise that makes the spectators wonder what is going to happen, and then in the end you forget about the loose end. Right? and quite a few of them are left. Same with Baird, a lot of hurry conclusions. This is a pattern that you find, especially in novels such as The Master of the World or um, the Robert the Conqueror. The first section of the novel is mystery. Something is about to happen. And this something, uh, is, is presented with a mix of attraction and suspicion. So this could be a positive change or this could be the beginning of the end for the community, society, the world in general. Mystery is followed by the revelation of the technology, but the revelation is accompanied by the abduction of some of the protagonists who are taken on board the technology. And they spend enough time on board to really feel the seductiveness of this technology. So they were afraid initially, they were suspicious, they're angry because they've been abducted, but then they fall in love with this incredible technology. For example, um, the people in uh, the uh, taken, John Strong, the, the, the scientists taken on board of the Albatross are taken on a three week trip around the world. And finally, because this is still moralistic literature, good versus evil, and evil has to be sanctioned, you have the destruction of the technology. Does it sound familiar? Well, it's half of the movies of this kind produced by Hollywood, right? Where at the very end, including 007, you have the destruction of the base of the evil man, the destruction of the technology, 
etc., etc., whether it be the star death or the headquarters of Spectre, etc. And of course, one way to serialize novels and make it more efficient to produce them is to have sequels, as in this case. So, a few notes about Robert the Conqueror, the first part of this two book, two novel series, and, and it was published in 1886. If you click in here, you can see a digital copy of the first edition. This is the illustration that you find in there in the frontispiece. This is the French, uh, and, and you find the vessel with the front propeller. You find the inventor and commander at the top in control. You find these lights being uh, cast on the ground out of this uh, dark uh, landscape because the idea is that people are afraid and don't really, people on the ground don't really know what this is about. And you see the people who are afraid, scared, or even flee. The relevant passages in the plot of this novel are the following. Mystery, right? Remember the first act in this kind of pattern. Mystery in this case is a series of premonitions and confused reactions. Because someone is uh, producing noises and music from above that no one can identify the source of. Someone is placing flags on top of, a, of very tall buildings in different areas of the world. Therefore, whoever is doing this possesses a kind of fantastic speed. And the kind of speed that gives the impression of ubiquity, which means to be in several places at the same time. Because, of course, the idea of speed and transportation in this kind of literature transitions towards the dissolution of the traditional notion of space, right? Following this phase of premonitions, the phase of, of mystery before the revelation, you have the abduction. The abduction is set up, is, is set up in this way. There is a debate in Philadelphia at the Walden Institute, a lot of professionals and scientists and engineers are discussing the future of air transportation. And most of them take the side of the future of air transportation belongs to lighter than air vessels, such as hot air balloons, dirigibles, etc. There was a lot of hope, even though that kind of technology never really blossomed, never really delivered, right? Because it came around, its final development came around the same time that planes were introduced. For the first 100, 120 years, not much was done with that. And the other side of this issue is, of course, those who believe that some kind of heavier than air vessel will be the future of flying something like a plane, okay? So the chief experts, the leaders in this kind of institute are kidnapped following the debate and they're taken on board the albatross. So from the abduction, you have, you, you proceed to the next step, which is the seduction, right? So they're hostages, on this ship and they're taking around the world for three weeks and essentially this is not a kidnapping they're not treated as prisoners because where they can can they go right they're, they're flying high in the sky they have no parachutes etc therefore this is a giant demo of the technology and throughout this demo they feel the fascination of this technology Finally, of course, while the ship is lower on the ground being refueled and restocked, 
they managed to escape from the ship, from this flying ship, and they caused explosions that will apparently destroy the new technology. Of course, the new technology is not, we'll learn later, it was not completely destroyed, and the inventor will come back 20 years later or so. Okay? So you have the, the mystery, you have the revelation, but in this case, the revelation is preceded by the abduction, you have the seduction and the destruction. The conclusion is interesting because in the conclusion, the Walton Institute sponsors the creation of the first flight of this dirigible called Go Ahead, which is an omen, a sign of the future. When the people are looking up in the sky to see how well this dirigible is flying and going up, gaining altitude, a new Albatross ship appears. The inventor did not die. He's coming back. There is a duel in the sky. The dirigible is about to fall and therefore they are forced to be rescued to accept the rescue by the albatross and Robert puts his former hostages on the ground and then delivers a final speech which is interesting it has two parts it's interesting because it gives a good idea of the moralistic view of technology right because this robber is not just an inventor a madman an evil man but he's also a kind of technology prophet not prophet in the sense of predicting the future simply but however the prophet the biblical prophet is a figure who's critical of society right critical of moral things so robert in front of this audience says citizens of the united states my experiment is finished so we know that this is an experiment it's just a test but it, it means that he will come back that this technology is not over it's over for now, but not forever. My advice to those present is to be premature in nothing, not even progress. So the inventor himself is rejecting the technology. The inventor himself is saying, I will hide this technology from you because you're not good enough to be able to handle it. Okay, so you see the moralistic view. Because up to this point, you would expect this evil madman to fully exploit to his advantage the technology, commercially, politically, militarily, right? And then he comes back and he says, no, 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 kids, you're not ready for it. I'm taking this from you. Maybe I'll come back another time. In a word, we must not be, be before our time. Keep in mind, this is the 19th century. It's also the time of political revolutions, of social changes. So this is a conservative point of view, right? Be moderate in everything, including technology. So, the inventor himself is saying, I've come too soon today to withstand such contradictory and divided interests as yours. You're divided, you're not united, you're not in a harmonious society, you don't deserve this kind of technology. And then, this is his final goodbye. I go then, and I take my secret with me, but it will not be lost to humanity. Because, of course, if you want to have serials, if you have to want to, have, if you want to have sequels, rather, you have to leave something open for it, right? Uh, Etc. And you can read the rest yourself. So this is the comment by the narrator, Robert is the signs of the future, perhaps the signs of tomorrow, certainly the signs that will come, will greatly change the social and political conditions of the world. However, this kind of changes are seen as dangerous, and that's why the technology is withdrawn from humanity. And this is what you call a moralistic view of technology. So, 1904, the sequel, Master of the World. Beginning of the novel, we are in North Carolina, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and you can click and see this on Google Maps if you're not familiar with this part of the world. 
this is where we are although the mountain where the terror is flying from is, is itself fictional there are scenes chapters that take place in the Great Lakes and other chapters that take place in the Caribbean so quite a bit of traveling is done in here as well the hero on the side of good is as I said John Strzok and Vern not being familiar with federal agencies simply calls him head inspector in the federal police department at Washington initially the mystery the phase of suspicion is uh, uh, accompanied by apparitions of this machine disruptive because society is thrown into a chaos by this and although through these apparitions they get a sense the technology is revealed they cannot understand whether this is three separate machines or four right because they know that there is someone who is going very fast on the road, flying, going on water, then even underwater. Following the partial revelation, Strzok, the hero on the side of good, is abducted and of course they, they beat him on the, on the head he wakes up on the on this uh, scientific on this science fiction vehicle this futuristic vehicle called the terror and again is not held as a prisoner is free to explore to go around to to look from the window and therefore you go from mystery to abduction oh, i should have added here seduction in fact i can add it now Okay, I need to log in. And from abduction to seduction, you go to the distraction of the machine. At some point, there is this trope, literary trope of the ignition, which is the moment when a character who had disappeared and comes back is recognized, right? Which is typical of literature. For example, you find Ulysses or Odysseus, who goes to fight the war in Troy, comes back after 20 years to his wife and they don't recognize him until a, a fatal moment. So the recognition here is that this is the same robber of the previous novel who has survived. After the distraction, what is the conclusion? There's a storm. The storm with lightnings causes the distraction of the terror or so it seems. And John Schrock goes home, and it's a very plain kind of comeback, back to his regular life. Robert is missing in action. They cannot find, the machine is destroyed, they cannot find his body though, so this leaves it open for possibly another sequel, but Vern died the next year. What are the tropes or themes in this kind of literature? The idea that technology is associated is, is pre-announced by dark and powerful, ominous signs, right? It's something you perceive physically, but it makes you uneasy. And you have experiences that cannot be explained. You know they're real, but you don't have an explanation because the technology is too new. And you have some premonition that this might be a force of evil. The very first experience before the full revelation, the first experience of the technology is nerve breaking, induces fear and confusion, chaos, anarchy, unsettling, but then there is the seductive stage, right? Where you are completely fascinated, enthralled by the technology. Verne, as part of its moralism, insists a lot on human control having limits, right? There are things you cannot control, and therefore you should be moderate in introducing change, changes. Nature is still a force to be reckoned with in this literature. 
And interestingly, even though it's the 19th century, it seems like there are a lot of parts of the world that are completely unexplored, including North Carolina. So you have this dormant volcano, and they say to the reader, nobody's been there, nobody can get there, nobody can really see what's inside the crater, and they try to do it with a hot air balloon. And this is true of, of the high seas, or under the sea, uh, remote islands, etc., etc., etc. Nature is also the place where you harvest energy. So, yes, there is the help of technology and science, but nature itself provides the sources of energy. In this case, electricity coming from the air. So the terror is able to fly and uh, get electricity while flying to recharge its batteries. And you're familiar with the modern expression, the bleeding edge of change, to be at the bleeding edge of a technology. Where bleeding emphasized, if you're at the bleeding edge of a new technology, then there will be suffering, there will be pain. And this is very true in, in this French author from the 19th century. If you try to deviate too much or too quickly from the norms, social norms, norms that are supported by natural laws, then there will be consequences, okay? Not good consequences. And usually in this kind of literature, you have this final warning. You have the moralistic message at the end. In case any reader missed it, you have someone, the narrator or the character saying, this was bad, don't do it again. Be careful in when you're playing with the future. Of course, the conclusion is always open-ended, right? Be ready for the return of this technology or be worried that this technology will disrupt your life and pessimism prevails. After all, rubber is not very different from the caricature of the mad inventor that you find in Austin Powers, right? Dr. Evil. How so? And before Dr. Evil, you have a lot of uh, not comedic versions of this lone inventor character. You have someone who's operating on a global context. In plenty of films from the 20th century, you have this kind of madman, scientist, inventor with, with some kind of incredible technology at his disposal and is operating on a global context and trying to use the technology for power or domination. This kind of inventor is separated from society, right? It's like Dr. Evil. Where does Dr. Evil come from? And the technology itself does not come from an urban area. It's associated with some kind of isolated locale, right? Often an exotic locale. 007 would be the perfect example. The 007 movies from the 1960s, 70s, 80s especially. The technology doesn't come from the industrial setting, right? It's outside of the regular channels of research and development. The initial interactions of the inventor, their technology with the world are similar to Vern. Enigmatic signs, people are offered clues they cannot interpret, letters or messages, debates, and you find some examples of letters if you want to. Of course, in this kind of literature, from Jules Verne and Robert to Dr. Evil, there are incredible holes, right? Gaps in the narrative that you can explain. So they seem to have a lot of henchmen, right? That were that are working for, for them. Do, where do they come from? How were they recruited? Where were they trained? Where are their families? You don't know. You just know that you go to Spectre's base or Dr. Evil's version of it and you find dozens or hundreds or thousands of people and they're just there, right? 
the technology itself. Where were the resources gathered to create this technology? Energy, material, etc. Never explained from Vern to Austin Powers. And very hard to believe that you have usually technology that is born ready or quasi ready, right? Boom, from the get go, it works in a threatening way. No signs of a development, no visible bugs. The mad inventor itself himself becomes a character that will have a long series of models from the 19th to the end of the 20th century. He's a, some kind of engineer, but is deviant, deviant in a technological way, right? Usually is a character who's very temperamental, changing mind, his mind quickly, narcissistic clearly, charismatic though, right? With, with some charisma, because this has to work for the phase that is called the seduction of the technology, right? Displays hubris. Hubris means moral arrogance, right? His plans are grandiose. And it seems like some kind of great revolution can be realized. The social order is being threatened. The natural balance of the social order, the order, the natural, natural hierarchy. And anarchy and chaos are really the, the tools to promote change in this kind of narrative from birth on. What is that is happening, interestingly, we're still in the 19th century with Jules Verne. So we have an interesting mix of old and new in this literature. Plenty of traces of the old world. So the albatross flies, but it's not a helicopter. It's shaped like a traditional ship. The terror has wings like a bird or like an invention of a flying machine by Leonardo da Vinci. The technology is somewhat magic or supernatural, right? This idea that they can be everywhere in an instant, in a very short amount of time, they can travel everywhere. They never run out of energy, right? Never a problem, no matter how big the vessel is, how quick they travel. When you look at the descriptions, there is plenty of advanced technologies, but there is also interesting a mix of old decor, right? The inside, the furniture, the places are more similar to a ship or a house from the 19th century. And it's very much a middle-class fantasy. That is the kind of reader for this literature. Meaning, if my wishes came true, if I had unlimited resources, what could I have? A ship that is luxurious and also travels everywhere very quickly, etc. In many ways, this kind of hybrid between advanced technology and regular fixtures is reminiscent of the steampunk genre, and if you don't know about it, you can click on it. I added this illustration. This is a beautiful series of illustrations by Alberto Vida, 1902, and this is supposed to show Paris in the future. And it is the same kind of hybrid representation, right? Because you have this futuristic looking flying vehicle, but the people are dressed like people from the 1900s. And the people are coming out of the opera. They're going to restaurants. So it's really this clash between really new and really old. Altogether, the ideology of this literature represents a shift from the past to the future in some aspects, in some regards. The idea, for example, that the notions of space and time are changing. And the process of mobility, transformation, and transportation being transitioned from a step-by-step -step kind of process to a more fluid 
reality or, or situation where speed and these kinds of devices, whether it be moving on the ground or flying, etc., are not simply taking you from point A and point B. Point A and point B are not important anymore. What's emphasized is being in transition so that traveling at speed is a dimension in itself. So it's not the temporary state that you go through when you move from point A to point B, but it's the new dimension of modernity. Modernity is not about being linked to one place or two places. It's about being in motion. And being in motion is the new permanent reality. That's the idea. So what I mean by step by step, think of agriculture, right? You plant the seeds, you wait, you reap the crops. Or manufacturing, you do something and you produce a product. But the same is true for administration and bureaucracy. The opposite of this is electricity. Electricity is fluid. And it gives you this idea of almost instantaneous transfer, right? You send electricity through a wire with a telegraph, for example, and it seems to travel almost instantaneously, right? And that's the new emblem of modernity. And globalization, not as the total sum of all the places being connected. No, it's the planet as one place with no distinction. Do you understand the difference? Globalization existed even in the Renaissance, right? Because people would go to Indonesia and buy nutmeg and then sell it in Venice and from Venice it would be sold again in London, etc. But this is a different kind of globalization. It's the idea that there are no multiple places anymore. There is one place that can be reached almost instantaneously. And finally, I'm getting closer to the end of this, one trope that you find in this literature which is still heavily relied on for fiction books and movies is the idea of the madman as the evil engineer or scientist who knows everything about this technology and we don't know how or why they know everything. But how do you develop an interesting narrative? You place this evil but very savvy, very expert character next to a virgin, in this case a tech virgin, someone who knows nothing about the technology and will be seduced and fascinated by the technology. And this kind of trope is at the basis of uh, too many, really, it's kind of boring at this point, too many movies and books, right? Uh, so you find it at the end of the 19th century with Sherlock Holmes. Who's next to Sherlock Holmes? Dr. Watson, who seems to be someone who's always the last one to understand who's the murderer or how Sherlock Holmes reached his conclusions. They live together. They work together. And yet, Dr. Watson, who's a doctor, real doctor, is always the last to know. It's the contrast between these two characters that make the narrative lively. But the same is true for Fifty Shades, right? You have this super sadist who knows everything about the uh, body and stimulating how to excite sexual reactions next to a woman who's practically a virgin. And this kind of contrast is supposed to move the narration. Or go back to the end of the 20th century, a lot of movies about cops or soldiers where you have a veteran cop, a veteran soldier next to the recruit. And again, this kind of dynamic moves the narrative. Uh, on. Let me pause a moment to circulate the attendance. And I'm trying to see what else I need to explain because you can read everything by yourself. I think pretty much the rest of it would be easy for you to digest at this point. So we have five minutes left for questions.
or for comments and otherwise I will keep you prisoners and, and prevent you from leaving the room without any questions in case you're thinking of just escaping. So questions, comments, or anything you know about this kind of literature, other examples, including films, that you have in mind, that you thought of when you uh, uh, listen to my introduction. Tegan? Are the, um, are the archetypes that are within these words and how they're used, do they sort of like evolve over time, or have they just basically just stayed the exact same? Not much, really. It's commercial literature, so a lot of small variations, right? But this is someone who's churning out novels <laughs> as quickly as possible, and he wrote dozens of them, became a millionaire, and as I said, up, up until the 1960s and 70s, these novels were still being republished in French, English, Italian, German, and many other languages and generations of kids growing up at the end or the middle of the 20th century were familiar with this kind of uh, juvenile fiction. What else? Questions, comments? Yes, yeah, Jordan. Why is there always a bit of fear uh, attack against technology? Well, this is the interpretation of Burke, right? So, it's hard to say whether this is reflective of society in general in France or Europe or around the Atlantic during that time. But in the case of this very successful artist, writer, that was the position he took during the second half of his life. His private life was not going very well. Uh, that might have played a part. And in general, I think that it is true that from the French Revolution on, there are two kinds of changes. One is the political change, right? The old monarchies of the past are trying to resist being turned into the new democracies of the 20th century. And the latest, the last act of resistance would be the totalitarian regimes in, in Spain, Germany, Italy, and the USSR. The last attempt to stop democracy from spreading but the other source of dramatic change was technology. By the time of the French Revolution, chemistry, physics have made dramatic advancements, right? By, by that time, by the time Napoleon is, is leading his army through Europe, Volta has invented a battery. They don't know what to do with it, but they have an electrical battery. They can master plenty of chemical reactions to produce energy, to produce explosives, etc. So there might have been indeed this sense that technology was jumping ahead while social values, the culture of society in general, was still pretty much the same and remained the same until World War II. Really, it is the post-war period where those old cultures crumble almost everywhere in, in the world. So this might explain this fear of, of the new, because you're equipped with a view of the world that is not made to include that kind of new technology and new science. Of course, it's open to interpretation, okay?